Okay, so let's make our way to the sixth section of the lecture on defining magnetism this time in this sixth section. By the way, if you actually take a look at this diagram, which I've showed you before a few sections ago, we actually have the uh, AC current diagram of uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz. This is the conjugate magnetodielectric diagram that defines the entire universe. We actually see the a same current flowing down the AC power lines, alternating current. The same field geometry between the lines as we actually see if we were to actually encapsulate this diagram in black, representational of the magnet. We have the plane of inertia, the uh, expanding toroid, and inverse to that we'd have the uh, hyperboloid, or the hourglass shape, to increasing inertia and acceleration to uh, the plane of inertia, or the null point in counter space. And here we have, of course, this point source emission. Why do you think, and you need to think about this for a second, hearkening back to section 5, where we actually have point source uh, emanation, in the ancient Greek the word would be prohodos, um, defining laser light. You'll say, well, it's coherent light. No, what specifically it is is point source light. Everything is, and why is it at the center? Because at the center of a mass, we have the inverse of the mass itself, which is representational of force and motion, inertia and acceleration. You see, the pressure mediation of the plane of inertia, or this null point, if you're actually able to stick a Gauss meter probe between two magnets and bring them together to form one magnet, you would see that there's zero magnetic flux. There is no magnetism at the center of any and every magnet. You know, this notion of polarity, you need to understand, is the inverse of counter space. Why do you think the block wall or this dividing line, and it's not a line because it has no location, exists at the absolute inverse of the spatial mass itself. Whatever the mass may be, the pressure mediation of counter space, the block wall, the plane of inertia, it doesn't matter what people call it, brings itself not to, as meant place, because it has no Cartesian value, to the inverse of the magnetic force and motion in the actual spatial mass itself, because this is necessitated. This is, as I mentioned before, the ancient word, Greek word ananke. It cannot exist any other way. I mean, that's, that is the resting or the lowest pressure point between force and motion, i.e. magnetism. This is the conjugate magnetodielectric geometry that defines the entire universe. So let's go on to defining magnetism. And of course, oh my goodness, take a look at this. Here we have the electric field circuit. I don't know about you, but I think I see similarities between... Here we actually have one pole and another pole of a magnet over here, representational underneath the ferro cell. I think I see the exact same thing here on the right as I do on the left. I would like for you to take a look at that. Okay, a really old diagram from uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz. And over here we actually have the view of the uh, magnet underneath the supercell. Both of these look exactly the same, do they not? They do. So, let's get to uh, describing magnetism and... Uh, understand, you know, this fundamental concept of the universe that's never been defined in any book, nor in any college as well. Sure it has, and no, it has not. In electrical circuits contain, this is a quote from Charles Proteus Steinmetz, I should have said that to begin with, uh, an electrical discharges waves and impulses his book, so this is from Charles Proteus Steinmetz. In electrical circuits containing energy stored in the magnetic and dielectric field, the change in the amount of stored energy occurs by a series of changes from magnetic to dielectric and back again from dielectric to magnetic stored energy. It's because magnetism is the dielectric field. The conjugate force vector of energy, as meant inertia, being expressed as energy, but this expression, of course, is the dissipation of energy. All humanity throughout history has confused true energy with the release of energy. True energy is what humans call rest, and likewise humans consider force and motion as energy. But this is backwards, since force is the expression of the dissipation of energy. Um, this is another quote from Steinmetz. The magnetic and dielectric field of the conductors are both included in the term electrical field and are the two components of the electrical field. You see, this is where modern science, and this, I'm almost convinced, is a real conspiracy. And I'm not a conspiracy theory person at all. Because we think electricity is just this thing. And it's one thing. Electricity is not. The people that uh, are the gods of electrical theory, uh, Steinmetz, Faraday, Heaviside, Tesla, these people knew that electricity was a hybrid 
of dielectricity and magnetism. Phi times psi equals Q and Planck of electrification. Um, phi is the magnetic and psi is the dielectric. These two in conjunction create the electrical field. If you think you're smarter than Tesla or Charles Proteus Steinmetz or Oliver Heaviside, then you are an idiot. So I dare you to try to contradict me on that fact. That's actually the one thing that I think could be a possible conspiracy because electricity is not one thing, nor is it a type of field modality. It is not. It is a hybrid of magnetism and dielectricity. This is another quote and the last quote from Steinmetz. Many textbooks speak of the electrical charges on the conductors and the energy stored by them without considering that the dielectric energy is not on the surface of the conductors but in the space outside of the conductor, just as is also the magnetic energy. There is no such thing as magnetism as implied in autonomous field modality. Wherever magnetism observed, there is a necessitated, again this is the Greek word, ananke, conjugate presence, that being the dielectric. Magnetism is the dielectric field, as J.J. Thompson implied. Magnetism represents the force in motion and toroidal field modality as expressed by the loss of inertia or energy of the dielectric in the system or object, in this case, of course, the magnet. It is not for any mere coincidence that more powerful magnets have smaller spatial fields, and all power, of course, rests on the dielectric. It is also no coincidence that the largest spatial uh, magnetic fields are from weaker magnets, such as N35 and N40 Gauss. Here, if I actually uh, apply a couple of diagrams to the previous uh, diagram, excuse me, here, um, you can actually see the AC current, so I can actually apply the AC power lines, or I could just box it off and show you the magnet, um, show you the exact same field, field structure between the uh, the dielectric and the magnetic and the conjugate to magnetodielectric geometries of the torus and the hyperboloid that actually form this, uh, I'm going to use this thing, this uh, saying loosely, this yin-yang, which comprise the whole, or in the case of the Greeks would be the holos, you know, this uh, conjugate inseparability. And this inseparability is no different than speaking about principle and attribute, and no different than saying light and illumination. Do you think illumination is something different than light? We refer to light, and then we refer to illumination, but in referring to illumination, we're referring to light. I mean, these two are an inseparable conjugate uh, substrate, which are inseparable. There's nothing in the universe, too, whether seen or unseen, metaphysical or otherwise, it doesn't have at least one attribute. That's something that's an incredibly important point that only the ancient Pythagoreans would have taught you and something you never learned in high school or uh, college. It's not for any mere coincidence. Uh, oh, yeah, I already, already know. Excuse me, I was repeating myself there. <laughs> Force is always expansive. Inertia and acceleration is always contractive. The countless people use the phrase dielectric force or dielectric lines of force is 100% incorrect. This intellectual defect actually has to end. Expanding and contracting circles, again, they presume lines of force are, uh, that are torsional to the magnet or object, be it atomic scale or palpable magnetic scale, define what we conceptualize as magnetism. This is necessitatively so the lowest simplex pressure mediation that defines magnetic presence. Magnetism and space are but one and the same. The loss of inertia or power in the dielectric, which is incalculable, and manifests in an inverse incommensurable infinity, which is space which has no properties, only attributes, and exists wholly due to magnetic divergence alone, which is the force in motion manifestation of the loss of dielectric capacitance. The universe or Mother Nature is far, far simpler than the idiots of quantum and modern science paint a picture of. All is force in motion, inertia, and acceleration. All field modalities and interactions can be reduced to simply capacitance, resistance, magnetic permeability, and dielectric permittivity, and subliminally so to ether hysteresis. Magnetism is nothing more than the multiplicative field phenomena as witnessed by a point source field incommensurability that defines the perfect magnetodielectric geometry that fascinates mankind about magnets. The very same principle of point source luminal emissions from the lasers versus normal incoherent light are no different than the magnetism that people, in, people incorrectly think defines a magnet. We stupidly speak about diamagnetic, paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, but the universe's most diamagnetic element, bismuth, accelerates towards the center of a large neodymium magnet. All elements are fundamentally both diamagnetic, mostly so, and magnetic by dynamic nature of their elements. As already said, everything is capacitance, resistance, magnetic permeability, and dielectric permittivity. Uh, Dollard 
There you go. Dullard, in quoting J.J. Thompson in Heaviside, said that Thompson thought that magnetism was circling around the dielectric and it was ultimately a chicken or egg scenario that's never been resolved. But in fact, magnetism is merely the expression of the dielectric field and losing potential, which manifests expanding, expanding divergent centrifugal force vectors that in turn manifest both topos, i.e. space, and the measure of space, which is time. Geomagnetic precession is the very reason that temporal phase exists at all. If you want a perfect chicken or egg analogy humorously, the dielectric would be a chicken sitting uh, on its eggs in the coop, and magnetism would be the same chicken running around the coop. <laughs> Again, there is only one field. The unintelligent humanity has always sought to pigeonhole things again as being different from one another based upon merely attributional variances is, of course, the reason why we have so much confusion. Here we'd actually see a, a, a vectorized version of either pole of a magnet once again. Here we actually have true uh, magnetism at the edge. We have uh, centrifugal force in motion. And we have intermediate zones and the pressure mediation between the conjugate magnetodielectric, and we have the inverse of that, increasing inertia and acceleration. So the magnetism is flowing the one way, but it's not flowing, and it's not lines either. There's no such thing as lines of force. This is an absurd BS, as I told you a few chapters ago that came from Faraday. We actually have the conjugate interplay between the magnetodielectric of this uh, loss of inertia, which is, follows the rate of 1 over the phi to the power of negative 3, the expression native attribute of the dielectric or the ether itself, and the interplay of this geometry, which is necessitated, the expanding and contracting circles of the force in motion and the increasing inertia and acceleration between these two and the mediation on either pole of any magnet, we actually have this geometry. This is what you don't see in small magnets, but uh, like, you know, the most diamagnetic element in the universe, bismuth will accelerate towards the center of a magnet. It is repelled away from the centrifugal edge but it is actually attracted towards the uh, center. People don't understand that, nor have they actually even experienced or you know, tried to test stuff like that because it requires a large magnet to do it. Um, here we see the same thing in just uh, different uh, symbolism, different little arrows of the centrifugal divergence. This is only true magnetism here if we're looking at a, quote, pole of a magnet here. The only true magnetism is right here. And uh, this, of course, is also flux, extremely high, intermediate, and extremely high. But this is true magnetism. This is not. This is wholly different. This is wholly different than this is. And there's not a single textbook on magnetism out there that you'll read about this fact. Um, I grew up with liquid nitrogen doers and playing with yttrium, barium, copper oxide superconductors and always knew this was nonsense but didn't know why. There's not superconducting of anything. When chilled to liquid nitrogen temperatures, or LN2, these ceramic composites, in the case of the yttrium barium oxide, attain to nearly zero magnetic permeability, and a strong magnetic field floats on top of these ceramics. What we actually call superconductivity is actually absolute bullshit. What happens is, is that the uh, ceramic composites become basically magnetically bulletproof. This is the reason why uh, magnets will float on top of them when the ceramics are chilled to LN2 temperatures. is because the magnetic permeability shrinks to nearly nothing, and they literally become bulletproof to magnetic fields, so to say, using a loose uh, analogy there. So-called magnetic attraction is the exact opposite of magnetism. It's a dielectric acceleration towards increasing inertia or potential along the plane of inertia whose nexus is counter space or ether stasis. So-called magnetic repulsion is magnetism being multiplied uh, through external applied additional forces. These applied compressions are two increasing magnetotoroidal field pressures. Let's go on to this. Let's take a really long time to explain. This is how simple uh, space and time is. We have an accumulation and uh, force and motion, inertia and acceleration interplaying between each other. This is, of course, the ring magnet again underneath the supercell. Looking at a ring magnet through the supercell, we have the exact same pattern in the central void as we do uh, on a cube of any other magnet. This field geometry is not in or of the magnet, but of the field or the medium, the ether itself. A ring magnet is only special because its physical shape is the exact same geometric shape as the magnetism itself, that being a torus. Since magnetism is a dielectric field and all things begin and terminate in counter space, this defines that all phenomena are actually untruth from a metaphysical standpoint, and that counter space shouldn't be called counter space. Rather, ultimate reality. Um, it's another diagram would actually take a long time to explain. Simplex nature of Mother Nature. 
Sometimes these uh, diagrams like to flip really quickly. There we go. Charge, discharge, space, and counter space, convergent, divergent, centrifugal, centripetal, and we have ether modalities that are either radial, spatial, circular, or counter spatial. It's really as simple as this. It's actually even more simple than this. You know, uh, only humanity has tried to complicate Mother Nature. Mother Nature, now, I'm not against math at all, but Mother Nature does not use a calculator. Everything is a pressure mediation. Everything is either force in motion or inertia and acceleration. Charge or discharge. I mean, Mother Nature and uh, her uh, cosmic mechanics are actually extremely simple. I think I've shown you this before. Actually, I have not. This is a projection on the wall. I actually use the VCR to record this uh, spiral and this crosshatch pattern. And I fed it into a large uh, tube TV set, which is nothing other than a di dielectric discharge device. And you notice when I actually apply a magnetic field to this crosshatch, with a one side of a magnet, I'll end up with a, a clockwise spiral. And if I flip it over, I'll end up with a counterclockwise spiral. Well, isn't that interesting? Uh, same tube TV set, you can see the plane of inertia, centrifugal divergence, uh, centripetal hyperboloid. And uh, here I have it without the lines. Here we see the torus here. Here we see the, the uh, conjugate magnetodielectric or this interplay, this uh, superimposition of the torus and the hyperboloid. Just using a simple dielectric discharge device, which is all a tube TV set is. By using the same spiral as visioned here, this spiral here, which is clockwise, and we go down here, if I apply one clockwise size of the magnet, side of the magnet, it will spin the clockwise uh, spiral even more so. But if I use the inverse, and you notice the centripetal point here where there is light, is uh, counterclockwise. The centripetal point is always inverse to the centrifugal. Proof of this is right here. Anybody could test that themselves. By using the same clockwise spiral, if I apply the, apply the different side of the magnet, instead of turning the, uh, the spiral more so uh, clockwise, it will actually pull it in on itself and create this form. But this is the exact same. When we're looking at this here, and when we're looking at this here, we're looking at the exact same projection being twisted by inverse vortices, inverse vortices from one side of the magnet to the other. And you will also notice, too, if we only look at the center, we have a clockwise light vortex here, but on the other side, we have a counterclockwise light vortex here. Undeniable. Here's one last image I want to show to you. I want maybe the last image. I want you to look at this really closely and realize something here. With the ferrofluid and the surfactant, used in the magnetic polarity, we actually have uh, the central part. Just thinking about the very, very central part of centripetal convergence, we always have this black hole because this is representational. Wherever we see light, we are seeing magnetism. And of course, since the center part of any magnet is the dielectric, this is why we see nothing represented here. But if we use a dielectric discharge device like a huge tube TV set, which is the inverse image of a uh, supercell or ferrocell. Instead of seeing a black spot, we'll see a bright white spot, which we have here. But the magnetism is represented in black. You see, we have two different representations. Wherever we see light, we see magnetism. Wherever we see dielectric, we see black. The inverse here on the tube TV set, wherever we see black, we have magnetic. Wherever we see light, we have the dielectric. Proof positive better there does not exist. Let me repeat that. Proof positive, better example, does not exist. Um, the actual uh, nanoparticles of iron and the oleic acid surfactant that actually make up uh, the uh, ferrofluid will only coalesce and manifest light at the lines of the magnetic. And of course, there are no lines, as I told you. This is just the interplay between the magnetic and the dielectric. But this is actually a very important diagram. This is the end of section six and the finale of the uh, lecture on magnetism. I hope you like this six-part series. If you do, please click the link below. Any small donation is greatly welcomed, and I certainly take questions. There's only so much you could fit into a tight little lecture. Obviously, much greater expansion and elaboration requires a big old book, which I am the author thereof. So uh, if you like these, and I start to take Bitcoin now. I put a Bitcoin address below. Any little thing helps. If you're so if you're so inclined, do svidaniya, uvidim se paka, and uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, Lux everitas, bye.